Hello, and welcome back to the Election Tricycle, where every week we take our little tricycle around the world to look at some of the elections of 2024, focusing on those in the United States, the United Kingdom, and India. Now, normally I am joined by Rohan Venkat and Tom Hamilton, but Rohan is off this week, and Tom will be joining me a little later for our premium section. As a reminder, if you are not a premium subscriber, you can sign up at tricycle.hubwave.net or at my Substack emilyctampkin.substack.com. Um, but fear not, I am not going to monologue, soliloquy, share my thoughts, hopes, and dreams for the next 30 minutes, because instead, I am joined today by a very special guest, Karishma, Karishma Mehrotra, who is South Asia correspondent for the Washington Post. Karishma, thank you so much for being with me today. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. So you wrote a piece for the Washington Post um, called As India Votes, Women and the Young Could Put Modi and BJP Over the Top. And we wanted to spend some time today discussing that because I think, and we have, I know you've reported in the, in and on the United States as well, and, and we'll get to that too, but, you know, I think there is sometimes a stereotype that women and younger voters lean left or lean progressive or are... are um, and and then we look at the polls and that turns out not to be true. So I guess, could you speak a bit about whether or not the same stereotype um, with which we are so familiar in the U.S. and in Europe holds in India? And if it does, why it's actually not true for this election? Yeah. So I will say it's hard to predict any election, but especially an Indian election. Um, But I'll speak about the trends that I think a lot of political analysts have seen in India, which is that um, while in many other parts of the world, women do tend to lean left, um, or at least, as you say, the stereotype is such, in the in India, it's not so much the case. Um, And actually, these two constituencies Um, in many parts of the country seem to lean more towards the BJP and the current Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Um, And so in terms of reasons why, um, see the traditional reason that many people describe for women voting for the BJP is because of what they call in India welfare schemes, which are basically government programs um, that give out maybe food rations or gas cylinders or various um, needs of a household. And uh, because a lot of those needs are things that women often use or work with, they in particular have been um, the beneficiaries of them. They've also been targeted specifically by the BJP with these uh, programs. So there was this account opening scheme or, or program where um, women had accounts opened in their names. So uh, the BJP is not the first first party to do this, um, to sort of target women in a very, very conscious way, um, but has done it at a scale across the country that I think a lot of political analysts have noted as a, as a primary factor for why women could be leaning towards the BJP. Some other factors in certain parts of the country also include Um, perceptions, uh, real or not, around law and order and women's Mm. safety. Um, And especially in the biggest state in India, uh, Uttar Pradesh, in UP, which is sort of seen as an important um, bellwether for what happens in a national election. The, um, The law and order perception and the narratives around law and order with the chief minister or the head of that state there uh, has been particularly uh, tailored and geared towards women as well, where women have expressed a feeling of safety and security, and especially this idea of a strong man in power provides more feeling of safety and security. And I don't think that's totally separate from safety and security in a bigger, larger sense in terms of nationhood, right? So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. from terrorism and protection from Pakistan, and they they are um, somewhat separate, but narrative-wise, I think they sort of bleed into each other when you look at a strong man and authority, authority figure. Um, the third one that I don't think is talked as much about, even in India, but I think is interesting, is there's this concept of service within the right, the Hindu right in India, the Hindi name for is seva, And it comes from um, the affiliated sort of, you might say, the mother of the BJP, the cultural organization that uh, um, uh, precedes the BJP, the RSS. And the RSS has always had a very strong component of service. 
Um, and that can be sort of community service. It can be temple cleaning. It can be um, a service to your, to your society, service to Hindus. There's this sort of thread throughout of um, seva or service. And some analysts have said that getting women outside of the home for political activities is difficult. Um, getting women outside the home in general in many parts of India is difficult, but getting them out for the idea of service is just an extension mm -hmm. of what they would be anyways doing in their private spaces. Um, so women have tended to join in those sorts of events. And I do think, um, I do think that there is something to be said for women being more religious or at least women being allowed to be religious in a public space where maybe they won't be allowed to be other types of things in a public space. So for example, there are these sort of prayer meetings or prayer song meetings that um, the RSS will have. And that, that seems to get a lot of women to come out. Um, so I think you have to understand the context of what is a woman allowed to do in the public space and um, how can you fit a, a framing within politics that lets women in through that. And it seems like the BJP has been able to capitalize that particularly. In terms of youth, um, I think it's it seems like a bit of a simpler one, maybe not so many different factors to go down. It's this sort mm -hmm. of aspirational feeling about being a, a rising global superpower, being an India that can stand up to America, being an India that's being courted by all these other countries. Um, I think that sort of aspirational thing seems to matter to the youth, but the unemployment situation in India is a strong uh, thread in this election. And when I wrote this story before the election had started, um, we didn't quite have a sense of how strong that would be. I think now, at least narrative wise, what we see is that unemployment is no small matter in this election and it affects the youth disproportionately in India. Um, and it's unemployment and it's underemployment. So if we see in this election, the youth are still voting for Modi in big numbers they are doing what many, what stumps so many pundits, political pundits in India, which is that you have voters who are voting almost, um, I mean, you could say getting to like the US comparison, quote unquote, against their interests, which I'm not so sure we should be saying, but it kind of goes to this thing of even though their salary wages, their employment situation, their inflation has not been better, um, they're voting for a bigger idea than them. Um, and that bigger idea is maybe religion. That bigger idea is maybe this um, larger national superpower image. Um, but those are the things that youth often talk about in terms of why they feel like voting for uh, the BJP. Your point about voting for or against interests is really interesting and important because they are voting for their interests, but their interests are defined differently by themselves than maybe like me sitting here, right? Um, I, I did, I, I want to go back to something that you said about women and, and regions in India. But first, I did have one follow-up on the youth vote, which is that Rohan and I weeks ago had this exchange in which we, um, which some listeners might remember and others may not, um, this idea that actually young right-leaning voters in the US and in some cases in India are actually to the right of where their elders are, they were, where older conservative yeah. voters are. Um, and since you've reported on on both, I was sort of interested for your your thoughts on that. On because I think there certainly in the U.S. there's the sense that oh, with the next generation, they'll be more into climate change, yeah. and there and you know the youth will get, get all of this out of their system. But if you look at the the Republican right under 35 in the U.S., they're quite hardline. Um, and I know in some cases in India, right, like younger conservative voters are really quite like staunchly believe in this program. Yeah, I don't think there's any idea or uh, hope in India that, oh, the younger generation is going to, um, you know, salvage this new idea of India. I don't I don't think that that seems to exist that. Yeah. I, and generationally, it's much it's the reason why these two things are interesting in India, maybe I should have said it earlier, is um, not because these trends are so, the numbers show some major divergence. The reason these trends are interesting in a place like India is because politics in India has always been a household. So mm. parties would go to a household and that household would be voting the same way. And you could usually convince the man of the household and expect that all three to five to six others in that house will follow suit. 
that is fraying slightly. And now political parties cannot go to a household and assume, oh, just because the father is voting a particular way, everyone else is going to vote the same way. So that gives you a sense of even the idea of talking generationally in India is kind of, I would say, fairly new. Like, and that's why it's hard to, I think, make many broad claims about this, Mm -hmm. Um, even about women. You know, I don't think we can make super broad claims about what women are doing. But the reason it's interesting is because women are voting differently than their husbands. If we're seeing numbers where women are voting more than men, that means that there are many women who are voting differently than their husbands, which is a huge change in India, if if that's what's happening, which it seems to be. So back to your question about youth. I don't yep. think we have an answer for youth being more to the right or more to the left uh, on 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 a particular side than the previous generation. Um, but I do think that if if we're seeing any divergence of youth, it's interesting in India in a way that that might not be the case. I mean, the idea of an individual vote and individuality mm-hmm. is so different in places like the U.S. and U.K. In India, we might be getting be be seeing the beginnings of that idea. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I have a particular answer to youth being, you know, more to the right or not in that way. Um, on this being new, do you think that this is a trend that you started seeing during Modi's tenure? Like, is it that recent? Yes, it's that recent. Um, so one trend that might be considered before, um, growing before Modi's tenure is the rise in women turnout. Women did not used to turn out to vote uh, nearly as much as men. So their absolute numbers were much, much lower. Um, And then even the percentage of women that were voting as compared to the percentage of eligible men voting was also lower. Um, Now we're starting to see not only that percentage starting to match up uh, between eligible men and eligible women, the percentage that are voting. We're also seeing in some states absolute numbers of women voting more than absolute numbers of men, which is pretty insane um, when we look at like the female to male ratio in in some of these states. Um, That trend happened before Modi, but this trend of a divergence in voting where they might Mm. be voting in different ways is something that we are seeing uh, within his tenure. Keep in mind, his tenure has been the last 10 years. Um, so it's been a while, uh, that we've had Modi in power here. Um, but yeah, it is something that, that people say, uh, has been happening more during Modi's tenure, but again, the targeting of women and the mobilization of women didn't begin with him. Um, there are regional leaders that are credited much more, um, for that, uh, uh, legacy of that women vote, Um, And again, that revolved around specific government schemes. So in the state of Bihar, it was a government scheme that gave women a bicycle to bike Mm. to school. Um, And that sort of mobilized women in a particular way to come out and vote. Um, So yeah, this is this is something that I would say is fairly new within the political landscape in that way. And are there so we've talked about parts of the country where you are seeing this this um, this trend among women where they're coming out and they are expected to vote for Modi and the BJP. Are there parts of the country or states where either you're not seeing the same turnout among women or you're seeing women who are coming out against the program of Modi and the BJP? Yeah, so I, I definitely, there are. The answer is 100% yes, which is why I would actually frame this more as the fact that we're seeing it in any states is interesting. So mm, instead of asking mm-hmm. where it's not happening, it's right, the where fact is it that happening? it is happening. In, um, and, so, and it's been so recent that I don't think you could even, um, you can't say this is a trend even in the last national election five years ago. The turnout is the trend, like I said, that's longer. Right. But I would say this women voting differently trend has really started being a conversation in India starting in 2022, two years mm-hmm. ago. So all we have since 2022 to show that are state elections. Mm. And I found in my um, looking at the numbers, four states where it was happening, Chhattisgarh, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, and Rajasthan. Um, So these are mostly north central um, states in India. And uh, I do think it's interesting, like I was saying, a state like Uttar Pradesh where um, it's a very important state politically in India, but it's also fairly a conservative state in many ways. Um, And the fact that we're seeing that divergence, even in a place 
like um, UP is fairly interesting. And these numbers, again, it's it's a difference of two to three percentage um, uh, points, you know, where maybe women are voting at 47 percent for the BJP and men are voting at 45 or 43. Um, so that's sort of the range that we're looking at with these with these states. So, yeah, this is a trend. The fact that it exists at all is what's interesting right. that. Right. For right. so long in India, it's been a household vote. So imagine from a political party standpoint, if you now can't go to a household and only speak to the man, what does that mean for the women right. you have to um, inculcate in the party? What do you need for women workers? Like I went to um, this city called Bhopal a couple of weeks ago for some election reporting, and I was on election day, there were women at the BJP booth um, outside of the polling booth where they were helping voters, you know, get their voter ID cards, et cetera, et cetera, voter slips. And um, I was watching what they were doing in that day. And the women were the ones who were supposed to go out and go home door to door and see if people had voted. And the reason they were sending women is because the women can then go further in the home than the men can and and make see what, what are the women up to? What are the women doing? Um, so I do think it changes a lot of pol like the political dynamics of a country like India when you see this happening anywhere, you know? Right, um, right. Because you're not just talking about the result. You're talking about the entire process of the election, how you campaign, who's involved in campaigning, who's sort of the privileged audience or assumed audience while you're campaigning. Exactly, exactly. And 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 what are the sort of quote unquote gifts, the political gifts you give? So mm -hmm. um, there was this, the reservations in India are like affirmative action in the West. And there was um, a bill for uh, reservations or um, select for select seats in the parliament for women. Um, so it hasn't been implemented yet, but the BJP has brought this through and have been using it as a strong statement of their consideration of women, that we are going to reserve a certain section of the parliament just for women. Um, and that was used as a strong. So there's many of these um, political sort of uh, gifts that you give for these constituencies once they start to differentiate themselves. Mm. Um, I have one more question on the story, which is you mentioned that youth unemployment is a huge issue. Um, and I guess my question is, are there, it's, it's basically the same question. Are there parts of the country where you feel that the, normal narrative on youth is a bit different hmm. or is it, or is it, you know, youth everywhere in India want to feel good about and proud of their country. And at the same time, youth everywhere is struggling with the economic reality. I think the economic reality is pretty strong th throughout the country, even though there are certain parts of the country that are doing better than others, obviously. Um, so the South is very much known to be a much wealthier, more developed, more educated, more literate, um, uh, wealthier part of the nation. Um, but nonetheless, I would say that employment is still, it's not, not a topic there for sure. It might not carry the same resonance that it does in the North. Um, but you're right. I don't think youth at all are a block across the country and there are far more divergences on the more typical and traditional, um, dimensions that are discussed in India, like caste and region, um, those are obviously still the strongest, and religion, of course, are the strongest cleavages within Indian society. Um, again, I think I pick youth and women because it's like, whoa, for so long we've been talking about right. caste and religion and region right. in India. Are these, is this a new thing? Um, I don't think I'd go so far to be like youth are a block in the country by no right. means. I think if you take an upper caste youth versus a lower caste youth, I think at the end of the day, their caste triumphs over their youth identity marker. Um, and that seems to be pretty, pretty strong still. Um, but the aspirational part, like you said, I think that is not even just a youth thing. I think that's a strong part in India. And it's to the to the point where I feel like the word aspiration in India is a little bit cliche. And I yeah. kind of want to find a different word. Um but I don't know what word to find because it's true. Like you do. Um, I think what's different now though, is this idea that when you go out and you talk to voters, this idea that, Oh, you know, India's fifth in the world. And it's like fifth in the world. And what, it doesn't matter. Right. Like India's yeah. fifth in the world. Um, and that is a very interesting, probably new trend of um, India on the global stage being an actual domestic 
uh, electoral issue is is interesting. And, and that's also something that the BJP uses as uh, one of their um, sort of compliments to themselves, right? That we have made foreign policy a domestic issue for the first time. Foreign policy used to be this thing for the elite. And now, you know, you walk outside and whoever you're speaking to knows about the fact that the U.S. president said this to Modi. Like, that mm-hmm. is something that the PJP is very proud of. Um, so, I, and I think that's not just a youth thing, but when we do zone in on youth, it's something that comes up even more often, I would say. This is not totally related, and I'm not sure if it's something that you've reported on at length, um, but I'm going to ask it anyway, which is that it is my experience that within India, and certainly within Delhi, there's this assumption that Indian Americans are going to are going to or like have already started voting Republican because mm. there's this sense in India that Republicans are friendlier to India. And we can go like we can debate whether or not this is actually true. Oh, I've done a uh, lot of reporting on that. Right. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Basically, but like if you drill down, um, and I'm going to ask you for links to this that we can put in our um so you know, once you like, spoiler for the listeners, Indian Americans overwhelmingly, at least up to this point in history, vote for Democrats. Um, and even, even, even Indian Americans who are, you know, supportive of Modi and supportive of the BJP, like here in our country, will go out and vote for the Democratic Party. Um, can you speak a bit about how this is getting lost in, like, somewhere over the ocean? This there, there, there's, there's this disconnect between the assumption. I think. I think it goes both ways. This like this sort of lack of understanding about how Indian Americans are voting and what that means for Indian foreign policy. Yeah, I think it's a super interesting question. So yeah, we're like shifting lens a little bit here. It's, I I would say to an American election standpoint, and I did this story in uh, 2020 in the U.S. where I think for the first time Indian. America's foreign policy with India became a domestic issue for Indian Americans and how they were mm-hmm. voting in the U.S. Um, and I do think you're right. Indian Americans, by and large, are very left leaning. In fact, more so than not just other immigrant Americans, but other Asian immigrant Americans. So where I grew up in California, um, in the Silicon Valley, you have many uh, cleavages between Chinese Americans and Indian Americans, where Chinese Americans were af- often more conservative than Indian Americans. And I think religion has and Christianity has something to do with that. Um, but first of all, the template, let's understand, yes, most Indian Americans are Democrat. You have a strong segment of Indian Americans that will always be Republican for um, uh, financial issues, like for economic issues and on taxes, essentially, is the easy way of saying it. Um, and so wealthier Indian Americans, there's a sub a segment of them, they're not going to change their minds, they're not influenced by all of this. Now for the Indian Americans, especially the newer immigrants to the US, they are influenced by the relationship that the whatever that US president has with uh, Indian with India. And Mm -hmm. India in today's India often equals Modi, um, Mm -hmm. because for the past 10 years, all we have understood India to be in terms of foreign policy has been Modi. So when Trump made a huge, um, a huge red, a sort of huge uh, hug with Modi, Mm -hmm. right, during his Howdy Modi campaign or Howdy Modi rally in Texas, um, that did influence a lot of Indians to feel like, okay, Trump is a better friend of Modi than mm-hmm. Biden is. At that time, what we had seen was Biden and Kamala Harris had been saying not a lot, but some things about democracy, human rights, right. Kashmir. Um, they had mentioned it here and there. I mean, right. in the context of how much they could be saying, it was not much, but it was enough that a lot of people were upset that, you know, the Democrats give India a hard time. The Democrats are too hard on Modi. And so we want to vote for Trump. So uh, that was there. You know, I, after writing that story though, I did not, I did not go back. I don't think I looked back at the numbers or maybe I did. And I've now forgotten the person to really look at this is Milan Vishnov. He mm-hmm. does the best work understanding um, in Indian American voting and their relations to uh, India foreign policy. And so um, a lot of his reports will really break this down well. I am curious about how that will shape up in this election in the U.S. 
because um, Biden has now given a red carpet to Modi, right? And he's now, um, it's a different terrain now. It's a terrain where Democrats are not saying anything about Modi. It's a terrain where on some issues, Trump was kind of hard on India on economic issues and tariffs Mm -hmm. and subsidies. Trump was not easy on India. I'm not sure if, uh, I'm not sure if, the average voter necessarily knows that. But I will say from an Indian ecosystem standpoint, the um, idea of a Trump presidency being some godsend for India is is not as widespread as what you think. It's not that everyone right. in the Indian establishment is super happy about a Trump presidency. Um, and I think the biggest reason is that um, the, the erratic nature um, of his presidency makes it harder to work with. Um, and that the Democrats actually haven't been so bad. But if you talk to an average voter in America, usually what they say is that Republicans have been better for India than Democrats. That's usually what they what they would say. Um, but how that shapes up into voting is going to be interesting in this election. Um, but yeah, I, I am very interested in this question. Um, I guess my last question for you before the actual last question is, um, uh, you know, you've I guess this is, I'm sure in many, many ways, this is apples and oranges, but since you've reported both on U.S. politics and on Indian politics, um, like there are whole books that could be written about the question I'm about to put to you, but <laughs> what, I guess, how do they, what, how are they different? No, like yeah. just how, what are, what, are, what would you say are the most striking differences yeah. um, in reporting on politics in these two places? Yeah. I mean, I will say there are far more differences. I tried to think of some similarities because I don't want to make it seem like it's so foreign, but it is it is quite different. I, the one similar lens I would say about this particular election is <clears throat> there's a conversation around the quote unquote idea of India and preserving the idea in India, saving the idea of India. I don't think it's too different from the conversation you have on the left and the Democrats in the U.S. about democratic values and preserving democracy. Um, and in India, at this moment, you have this interesting question that's come up recently about around the constitution. Um, I think it's the first time in India where the constitution has actually become in 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 the election narrative. It's joined. It's become a part of the election narrative. Um, and I think that would carry some resonance with some some of the audience in the U.S. Also, issues around campaign finance have always. Um, been really tough, I think, for both countries, and they haven't quite solved the issue of campaign finance. And that was a topic in India right before this election with the new system for campaign finance that the BJP had introduced and was um, struck down by the Supreme Court called electoral bonds. So those are some similarities. On differences, I mean, I will say that covering a U.S. election, um, it's not about easy or difficult but the dimensions with which you work with in the U.S. are far, far less than the dimensions with which you're working in this, you know, pretty much continent. A, a continent of a billion yeah, people. A continent yeah. feel of a country. Um, and it's not to say the U.S. is not diverse. It's not to say the U.S. is not complicated. But if you walk into an average bar or you know, place where a bunch of people are sitting in the U.S. I know there's no such thing as an average bar in the U.S. But I spent the 2019 election night sorry, 2020, 2020 election night in a bar in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And um, it's a matter of five, six issues that come to the fore, right? Guns, abortion, economy, immigration. Um, yeah, I mean, these are like your your typical issues that'll come up. Um, in India, it's just far more complicated than that. I mean, it really depends what state you're in. Um, and it really depends the the dimensions within that state. It it is far more complicated in that way. Um, I think another major difference that maybe people don't recognize about India is while in the U.S. most of the winning presidents have gotten a majority vote share, although that doesn't always happen, but for the most part it does. Um, in India, they've the the winning party has never even had fifty percent of the vote share. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's when we talk about a mandate in India, it's a very different definition of a mandate than in the US. And, and what that means when you come to power is also very different, I think. So that's one thing that I was quite surprised by. Um, Another one for this current moment, of course, is that the opposition in India, 
while there's they've gained some steam in this election, it's a bit it's turning out to be a bit more interesting than maybe we thought it was when it started. The opposition, for the most part, has been fail- flailing. It hasn't felt like a close fight in a long time. Whereas in the U.S., you do feel like there's some sort of competition happening. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that Modi is a far more strategic and forward thinking politician than Trump is. Um, and so you still have this question in the U.S., right? Is Trump, is it a fluke? Like, you know, is this actually right. America or is it, it just happened once, you know, I mean, we'll find out. But in any <laughs> it's not a question, you know, it's not a question right. of it happened once. Like it is a strong DNA part of India and it's changed politics and in India forever. Um, one thing that people, it, if I were to put Indian politics very crudely, um, and this is very crude because it does not, keep into mind all the dimensions within regions, et cetera. But there's a, there's a strong, um, it's a fight between identifying with your caste versus identifying with your religion. So what Modi has done has convinced a bunch of people of a bunch of different castes to believe in their Hindu-ness over their caste identity. And the other side trying to remind them that, no, you're this caste, vote for us. Um, And so it's interesting that, you know, the phrase identity politics in the U.S. is much newer, but India's always had this as identity politics. And it's always been about identity and they they haven't shied away from that. Um, The other part is, I guess, where in India you have issues right now of a level playing field. um, And in the U.S. you have this idea of like distrust over the results. Mm -hmm. And um, and. Like some people have said that that shows that India's elections are so much stronger that you don't have that distrust. While you have some criticism of the electronic voting machines that India uses, overall there's a quite a quite a fair general trust in the electoral pillar of democracy. While other pillars of democracy might be fraying, for the most part, the elections are the one thing that India has to claim strongly it's a democracy. Um, but on terms of the other institutions, um, I would say Modi has uh, done much more damage to other institutions than Trump has been able to. Um, the final one I would say is on turnout. Um, so the the best sort of turnouts in, in uh, the U.S. are usually India's like average or sometimes their worst, like slightly worse turnout, I would say. Um and, and with turnout also, the BJP is banking on a higher turnout, hoping for a higher turnout, but they haven't gotten that. So they're sort of worried about issues of complacency um, because everyone sort of feels like, oh, we know who's going to win anyway. Um, in the U.S., obviously, that's not the case. We don't really know who's going to win. But Biden uh, on, you know, the Democrats are worried that young Democrats and people of color might not come out to vote and that it was the high turnout in the last election that got him to power. Um and the other interesting thing about turnout and like who votes in India, who who finds dignity in a vote um, has always just been so interesting to me. Um, it's really the poor and those in the rural areas in India that have uh, always had high turnout. Um, and the 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 mobilization around an election in terms of um I'll give you, when I was in Bhopal, I mean, we are dealing with lower turnout than usual in India, but bear in mind that's still mid 60s. I was in Bhopal and I was just asking before the election, you know, are you voting? Are you voting? Are you voting? Everyone not only said, yes, I'm voting. They're like, why would you, like, why is that even a question? Like, of course we're voting. (laughs) Um, And and I actually, I don't even know if they will vote or not. I'm not so sure, but nobody could possibly say I'm not voting because it would be so shameful in India. There's so much dignity around the vote and they care about the vote so much. Um, and I, I've always thought that's interesting. But the other way to look at that is that the one time that the country and the country's powerful care about the poor is when they have to vote. And so the poor right. also know that this is my one time when I have a say, when I can make a difference, where I can have a voice. Um, and so it I do think that that's a, I, you know, you don't see that similar um, enthusiasm uh, uh, or gratefulness for a vote, um, I would say, which is an interesting. No, I, I once, I remember I told someone in Delhi what our, what our turnout is and they were 
uh, just disgusted. <laughs> they were like, that is terrible. <laughs> yes, it is terrible. Um, it is right. terrible. <laughs> like, yep, you're, you're right. Um, okay. So before we let you go, we close um, the regular part of every episode with a section called tricycle recommends, um, which, you know, we, we name pieces that we think our reader, our, our readers, our listeners should read. Um, we've already listed two of yours that we will put in the show notes. Um, but if you have anything else for us that you think tricycle, that you think election tricycle, uh, listeners might, might enjoy. Yeah. I'll do a little humble brag for our Washington Post team here. Um, Please. We were nominated for a Pulitzer for our tech series last year. I was going to say, for the Pulitzer uh, finalist Washington Post team. <laughs> yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, our series on technology, all the stories are great. I did one on um, how India has sort of tamed or controlled Twitter. Um, and so that was a really fun one I did with uh, Joe in San Francisco, um, we have one on OTT and sort of you can get a sneak peek into how, you know, the world of Bollywood and filmmaking has been influenced by it. Um, the, every single one of them is super, super interesting. And I think a great place to look. Um, so I would say that one is is one I would hope people would read. There's another one from last year that I did that has kind of been one of my favorites. It's about this a cartoon character called the Amul Girl in India, who is um, the mascot for butter and milk of a daily dairy cooperative, Amul. Um, and it's by far the most recognizable cartoon all across India. You will see Amul Girl everywhere. And what Amul Girl has often done in newspaper ads is sort of joke about the daily events of today and a little bit sarcastic, a little bit, you know, um, sprinkling some humor into some of our politics and all of that. But what has been happening over the past years is that it's become, again, a lot more tame. Um, it's not as funny and it's not as snarky and it's not as punchy. Um, and so I spoke to the cartoonists and the um, the writer and the people on that team and I got a sense of how they feel like in the politics of today in India, you can't really make the same jokes. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, I thought I thought I think it's a that's happening in so many different spheres of of Indian daily life. Um, but I thought this was an interesting and subtle way of describing the change of today's India. Um, so yeah, I would I would probably humble brag about those two. Yeah, I don't think you have to be humble. You can you're a Pulitzer finalist. Like you can just brag, um, <laughs> listeners. I have something for you that is not by me that speaks to what we were talking about last week, which is the economy and how in the U.S. it's good, but everyone thinks it's bad. Um, this has been confirmed by The Guardian, which exclusively reported majority of Americans wrongly believe U.S. is in recession and most blame Biden. So we will put that for you in the show notes as well. We're going to go now to the premium section. If you're not a subscriber, again, sign up tricycle.hubwave.net or at my Substack. But first, we must thank Karishma Mehrotra. Thank you so much for being with me today for The Washington Post. Um, uh, congratulations on on the, the Pulitzer uh, nomination and also good luck between now and uh, <laughs> and the end of the election. Yeah. Thank you so much, Emily. Thanks for having me. It's always fun. And I like comparing and talking about the differences and similarities between this country. So yeah, thanks so much.